This week's Grim Fairy Tales Fitcher's Bird There once was a wizard who used to take the form of a poor man and went to houses and begged and caught pretty girls. No one knew whether he carried them, for they never seen more. One day he appeared before the door of a man who had three pretty daughters. He laughed like a poor weak beggar and carried a basket on his back, as if he meant to collect charitable gifts in it. He begged for a little food. And when the eldest daughter came and was just reaching him a piece of bread, he did but touch her. And she was forced to jump into his basket. Thereupon, he hurried away with long strides and carried her away into a dark forest to his house, which stood in the midst of it. Everything in the house was magnificent. He gave her whatsoever she could possibly desire, and said, My darling, thou wilt certainly be happy with me, for thou hast everything thy heart can wish for. This lasted a few days, and then he said, I must journey forth and leave thee alone for a short time. There are the keys of the house. Thou mayst go everywhere and look at everything except into one room, which this little key here opens, and there I forbid thee to go on pain of death. He likewise gave her an egg and said, Preserve the egg carefully for me and carry it continually about with thee, for a great misfortune would arise from the loss of it. She took the keys and the egg, and promised to obey him in everything. When he was gone, she went all around the house from the bottom to the top, and examined everything. The room shone with silver and gold, and she thought she had never seen such great splendor. At length, she came to the forbidden door. She wished to pass it by, but curiosity let her have no rest. She examined the key. It looked just like any other. She put it in the keyhole and turned it a little, and the door sprang open. But what did she see when she went in? A great bloody basin stood in the middle of the room, and therein lay human beings, dead and hewn to pieces, and hard by was a block of wood, and a gleaming axe lay upon it. She was so terribly alarmed that the egg which she held in her hand fell into the basin. She got it out and washed the blood off, but in vain. It appeared again in a moment. She washed and scrubbed, but she could not get it out. It was not long before the man came back from his journey, and the first thing which he asked for were the key and the egg. She gave them to him, but she trembled as she did so, and he saw at once by the red spots that she had been in the bloody chamber. Since thou hast gone into the room against my will, said he, thou shalt go back into it against thine own. Thy life is ended. He threw her down, dragged her thither by her hair, cut her head off the block, and hewed her in pieces so that her blood ran on the ground. Then he threw her into the basin with the rest. Now I will fetch myself the second, said the wizard. And again he went to the house in the shape of a poor man and begged. Then the second daughter brought him a piece of bread. He caught her like the first by simply touching her and carried her away. 
she did not fare better than her sister. She allowed herself to be led away by her curiosity, opened the door of the bloody chamber, looked in, and had to atone for it with her life on the wizard's return. Then he went and brought the third sister, but she was clever and crafty. When he had given her the keys and the egg, and had left her, she first put the egg away with great care, and then she examined the house, and at last went into the forbidden room. Alas, what did she behold? Both her sisters lay there in the basin, cruelly murdered and cut in pieces. But she began to gather their limbs together and put them in order, head, body, arms, and legs. And when nothing further was wanting, the limbs began to move and unite themselves together, and both the maidens opened their eyes and were once more alive. Then they rejoiced and kissed and caressed each other. On his arrival, the man at once demanded the keys and the egg, and as he could perceive no trace of any blood on it, he said, Thou hast stood the test, thou shalt be my bride. He now had no longer any power over her, and was forced to do whatsoever she desired. Oh, very well, said she. Thou shalt first take a basket full of gold to my father and mother, and carry it thyself on thy back. In the meantime, I will prepare for the wedding. Then she ran to her sisters, whom she had hidden in a little chamber, and said, The moment has come when I can save you. The wretch shall himself carry you home again. But as soon as you are at home, send help to me. She put both of them in a basket and covered them quite over with gold, so that nothing of them was to be seen. Then she called in the wizard and said to him, Now, carry the basket away, but I shall look through my little window and watch to see if thou stoppest on the way to stand or to rest. The wizard raised the basket on his back and went away with it, but it weighed him down so heavily that the perspiration streamed from his face. Then he sat down and wanted to rest a while, but immediately one of the girls in the basket cried, I am looking through my little window, and I see that thou art resting. Wilt thou go on at once? He thought it was his bride who was calling that to him, and got up on his legs again. Once more he was going to sit down, but instantly she cried, I am looking through my little window, and I see that thou art resting. Wilt thou go on directly? And whenever he stood still, she cried this, and then he was forced to go onwards until at last, groaning and out of breath, he took the basket with the gold and the two maidens into their parents' house. At home, however, the bride prepared the marriage feast and sent invitations to the friends of the wizard. Then she took a skull with grinning teeth, put some ornaments on it and a wreath of flowers, carried it upstairs to the garret window, and let it look out from thence. When all was ready, she got into a barrel of honey and then cut the feather bed open and rolled herself in it, until she looked like a wondrous bird and no one could recognize her. Then she went out of the house, and on her way she met some of the wedding guests who asked, Oh, Fitcher's bird, how comest thou here? I come from Fitcher's house, quite near. And what may the young bride be doing? From cellar to garret she swept all clean, and now from the window she's peeping I ween. At last, she met the bridegroom, who was coming slowly back. He, like the others, asked, Oh, Fitch's bird, how comest thou here? 
I come from Fitch's house quite near. And what may the young bride be doing? From cellar to garret she swept all clean, and now from the window she's peeping I ween. The bridegroom looked up, saw the decked out skull, thought it was his bride, and nodded to her, greeting her kindly. But when he and his guests had all gone into the house, the brothers and kinsmen of the bride who had been sent to rescue her arrived. They locked all the doors of the house that no one might escape, set fire to it, and the wizard and all his crew had to burn. The Robber Bridegroom There was once on a time a miller who had a beautiful daughter, and as she was grown up, he wished that she was provided for and well married. He thought, If any good suitor comes and asks for her, I will give her to him. Not long afterwards a suitor came, who appeared to be very rich, and as the miller had no fault to find with him, he promised his daughter to him. The maiden, however, did not like him quite so much, as a girl should like the man to whom she is engaged, and had no confidence in him. Whenever she saw or thought of him, she felt a secret horror. Once he said to her, Thou art my betrothed, and yet thou hast never once paid me a visit. The maiden replied, I know not where thy house is. Then said the bridegroom, My house is out there in the dark forest. She tried to excuse herself and said she could not find the way there. The bridegroom said, Next Sunday thou must come out there to me. I have already invited the guests, and I will strew ashes in order that thou mayest find thy way through the forest. When Sunday came and the maiden had to set out on her way, she became very uneasy. She herself knew not exactly why, and to mark her way she filled both her pockets full of peas and lentils. Ashes were strewn at the entrance of the forest, and these she followed, but at every step she threw a couple of peas on the ground. She walked almost a whole day until she reached the middle of the forest where it was the darkest, and there stood a solitary house, which she did not like, for it looked so dark and dismal. She went inside it, but no one was within, and the most absolute stillness reigned. Suddenly a voice cried, Turn back, turn back, young maiden dear. Tis a murderous house you enter here. The maiden looked up, and saw that the voice came from a bird which was hanging in a cage on the wall. Again it cried, Turn back, turn back, young maiden dear, tis a murderer's house you enter here. Then the young maiden went on farther from one room to another, and walked through the whole house, but it was entirely empty and not one human being was to be found. At last she came to the cellar, and there sat an extremely aged woman, whose head shook constantly. Can you not tell me, said the maiden, if my betrothed lives here? Alas, poor child, replied the woman, whither hast thou come? Thou art in a murderer's den. Thou thinkest thou art a bride soon to be married. But thou wilt keep thy wedding with death. Look, I have been forced to put a great kettle on there, with water in it, and when they have thee in their power, they will cut thee to pieces without mercy, will cook thee and eat thee, for they are eaters of human flesh. If I do not have compassion on thee, 
and save thee. Thou art lost. Thereupon the old woman led her behind a great hogshead where she could not be seen. Be as still as a mouse, said she. Do not make a sound or move, or all will be over with thee at night when the robbers are asleep. We will escape. I have long waited for an opportunity. Hardly was this done than the godless crew came home. They dragged with them another young girl. They were drunk and paid no heed to her screams and lamentations. They gave her wine to drink, three glasses full, one glass of white wine, one glass of red, and a glass of yellow. And with this her heart burst in twain. Thereupon they tore off her delicate raiment, laid her on a table, cut her beautiful body in pieces, and strewed salt thereon. The poor bride behind the cask trembled and shook, for she saw right well what fate the robbers had destined for her. One of them noticed a gold ring on the little finger of the murdered girl, and as it was not come off at once, he took an axe and cut the finger off, but it sprang up in the air away over the cask and fell straight into the bride's bosom. The robber took a candle and wanted to look for it, but he could not find it. Then another of them said, Hast thou looked behind the great hogshead? But the old woman cried, Come and get something to eat and leave off looking till the morning. The finger won't run away from you. Then the robber said, The old woman is right, and gave up their search, and sat down to eat. And the old woman poured a sleeping draught in their wine, so that they soon lay down in the cellar, and slept and snored. When the bride heard that, she came out from behind the hogshead, and had to step over the sleepers, for they lay in rows on the ground, and great was her terror lest she should waken one of them. But God helped her, and she got safely over. The old woman went up with her, opened the doors, and they hurried out of the murderer's den with all the speed in their power. The wind had blown away the strewn ashes, but the peas and lentils had sprouted and grown up, and showed them the way in the moonlight. They walked the whole night, until in the morning they arrived at the mill, and then the maiden told her father everything exactly as it had happened. When the day came, when the wedding was to be celebrated, the bridegroom appeared and the miller had invited all his relations and friends. As they sat at table, each was bidden to relate something. The bride sat still and said nothing. Then said the bridegroom to the bride, Come, my darling, dost thou know nothing? Relate something to us like the rest. She replied, Then I will relate a dream. I was walking alone through a wood, and at last I came to a house in which no living soul was, but on the wall there was a bird in a cage which cried, Turn back, turn back, young maiden dear, tis a murderer's house you enter here. And this it cried once more, my darling, I only dreamt this, then I went through all the rooms, and they were all empty, and there was something so horrible about them. At last I went down into the cellar, and there sat a very, very old woman, whose head shook. I asked her, Does my bridegroom live in this house? She answered, Alas, poor child, thou hast got into a murderer's den. Thy bridegroom does live here, but he will hew thee in pieces, and kill thee, and then he will cook thee, and eat thee. My darling, I only dreamt this, 
but the old woman hid me behind a great hog's head, and scarcely was I hidden when the robbers came home, dragged a maiden with them, to whom they gave three kinds of wine to drink, white, red, and yellow, with which her heart broke in twain. My darling, I only dreamt this. Thereupon they pulled off her pretty clothes and hewed her fair body in pieces on a table and sprinkled them with salt. My darling, I only dreamt this. And one of the robbers saw that there was still a ring on her little finger. And as it was hard to draw off, he took an axe and cut it off. But the finger sprang up in the air and sprang behind the great hog's head and fell in my bosom, and there is the finger with the ring." And with these words she drew it forth and showed it to those present. The robber, who had during this story become as pale as ashes, leapt up and wanted to escape, but the guests held him fast and delivered him over to justice. Then he and his whole troop were executed for their infamous deeds. Old Hildebrand Once upon a time lived a peasant and his wife, and the parson of the village had a fancy for the wife, and had wished for a long while to spend a whole day happily with her. The peasant woman too was quite willing. One day therefore he said to the woman, Listen, my dear friend, I have now thought of a way by which we can for once spend a whole day happily together. I'll tell you what, on Wednesday, you must take to your bed and tell your husband you are ill, and if you only complain and act being ill properly, and go on doing so until Sunday, when I have to preach, I will then say in my sermon that whoever so has at home a sick child a sick husband, a sick wife, a sick father, a sick mother, a sick brother, or whosoever else it may be, and makes a pilgrimage to the Gockerel Hill in Italy, where you can get a peck of laurel leaves for a krauser, the sick child, the sick husband, the sick wife, the sick father or sick mother, the sick sister or whosoever else it may be, will be restored to health immediately. I will manage it, said the woman promptly. Now therefore on the Wednesday, the peasant woman took to her bed and complained and lamented as agreed on, and her husband did everything for her that he could think of, but nothing did her any good, and when Sunday came the woman said, I feel as ill as if I were going to die at once, but there is one thing I should like to do before my end. I should like to hear the parson's sermon that he is going to preach today." On that the peasant said, Oh, my child, do not do it. Thou mightest make thyself worse, or if thou wert to get up, look. I will go to the sermon and will attend to it very carefully and will tell thee everything the parson says. Well, said the woman, go then and pay great attention and repeat to me all that thou hearest. So the peasant went to the sermon and the parson began to preach and said, If any one had at home a sick child, a sick husband, a sick wife, a sick father, a sick mother, a sick sister, brother, or anyone else, and would make a pilgrimage to the Gockerly Hill in Italy, where a peck of laurel leaves cost a krauser. The sick child, sick husband, sick wife, sick father, sick mother, sick sister, brother, or whosoever else it might be, would be restored to health instantly, and whosoever wished to undertake the journey was to go to him after the service was over and he would give him the sack for the laurel leaves and the krauser. Then no one was more rejoiced than the peasant, and after the service was over, he went at once to the parson, 
who gave him the bag for the laurel leaves and the krauser. After that he went home, and even at the house door he cried, Hurrah, dear wife! It is now almost the same thing as if thou wert well. The parson has preached today that whosoever had at home a sick child, a sick husband, a sick wife, a sick father, a sick mother, a sick sister, brother, or whoever it might be, and would make a pilgrimage to the Gockerly Hill in Italy, where a peck of laurel leaves cost a krauser, the sick child, sick husband, sick wife, sick father, sick mother, sick sister, brother, or whosoever else it was, would be cured immediately. And now I have already got the bag and the krauser from the parson, and will at once begin my journey so that thou mayst get well the faster. And thereupon he went away. He was, however, hardly gone before the woman got up, and the parson was there directly. But now we will leave these two for a while and follow the peasant, who walked on quickly without stopping in order to get the sooner to the Gawker Hill, and on his way he met his gossip. His gossip was an egg merchant and was just coming from the market where he had sold his eggs. Who oh, may you be blessed, said the gossip. Where are you off to so fast? To all eternity, my friend, said the peasant. My wife is ill, and I have been today to hear the parson's sermon, and he preached that if any one had in his house a sick child, a sick husband, a sick wife, a sick father, a sick mother, a sick sister, brother, or anyone else, and made a pilgrimage to the Gockerly Hill in Italy, where a peck of laurel leaves cost a krauser, the sick child, the sick husband, the sick wife, the sick father, the sick mother, the sick sister, brother, or whosoever else it was, would be cured immediately. And so I have got the bag for the laurel leaves and the krauser from the parson, and now I am beginning my pilgrimage. But listen, gossip, said the egg merchant to the peasant, are you, then, stupid enough to believe such a thing as that? Don't you know what it means? The parson wants to spend a whole day alone with your wife in peace, so he has given you this job to do to get you out of the way. My word, said the peasant. How I'd like to know if that's true. Come then, said the gossip. I'll tell you what to do. Get into my egg basket and I will carry you home, and then you will see for yourself. So that was settled, and the gossip put the peasant into his egg basket and carried him home. When they got to the house, hurrah! But all was going merry there. The woman had already had nearly everything killed that was in the farmyard, and had made pancakes and the parson was there, and had brought his fiddle with him. The gossip knocked at the door, and the woman asked, Who was there? It is I, gossip, said the egg merchant. Give me shelter this night. I have not sold my eggs at the market, so now I have to carry them home again, and they are so heavy that I shall never be able to do it, for it is dark already. Indeed, my friend, said the woman, Thou comest at a very inconvenient time for me, but as thou art here it can't be helped. Come in, and take a seat there on the bench by the stove." Then she placed the gossip and the basket which he carried on his back on the bench by the stove. The parson, however, and the woman were as merry as possible. At length the parson said, Listen, my dear friend, thou canst sing beautifully. Sing something to me. Oh, said the woman, I cannot sing now. In my young days indeed, I could sing well enough, but that's all over now. Come, said the parson once more, do sing some little song. On that the woman began and sang, I've sent my husband away from me, to the Gockerly Hill in Italy. Thereupon the parson sang, I wish twas a year before he came back, 
I'd never ask him for the laurel leaf sack. Hallelujah. Then the gossip who was in the background began to sing. But I ought to tell you the peasant was called Hildenbrand. Hildenbrand, so the gossip sang. What art thou doing, my Hildenbrand dear? There on the bench by the stove so near. Hallelujah! And the peasant sang from his basket. All singing I ever shall hate from this day. And he got out of the basket and cudgeled the parson out of the house. The Singing Bone In a certain country there was once great lamentation over a wild boar that laid waste to the farmer's fields, killed the cattle, and ripped up people's bodies with his tusks. The king promised a large reward to anyone who would free the land from this plague. But the beast was so big and strong that no one dared to go near the forest in which it lived. At last the king gave notice that whosoever should capture or kill the wild boar should have his only daughter to wife. Now there lived in the country two brothers, sons of a poor man, who declared themselves willing to undertake the hazardous enterprise. The elder, who was crafty and shrewd, out of pride, the younger, who was innocent and simple, from a kind heart. The king said, In order that you may be the more sure of finding the beast, you must go into the forest from opposite sides. So the elder went in on the west side, the younger on the east. When the younger had gone a short way, a little man stepped up to him. He held in his hand a black spear and said, I give you this spear because your heart is pure and good. With this, you can boldly attack the wild boar and it will do you no harm. He thanked the little man, shouldered the spear, and went on fearlessly. Before long he saw the beast, which rushed at him, but he held the spear towards it, and in its blind fury it ran so swiftly against it that its heart was cloven in twain. Then he took the monster on his back and went homewards with it to the king. As he came out at the other side of the wood, there stood at the entrance a house where people were making merry with wine and dancing. His elder brother had gone in here, and thinking that after all the boar would not run away from him, was going to drink until he felt brave. But when he saw his young brother coming out of the wood, laden with his booty, his envious, evil heart gave him no peace. He called out to him, Come in, dear brother. Rest and refresh yourself with a cup of wine. The youth, who suspected no evil, went in and told him about the good little man who had given him the spear, wherewith he had slain the boar. The elder brother kept him there until the evening, and then they went away together, and when in the darkness they came to a bridge over a brook, the elder brother let the other go first, and when he was halfway across, he gave him such a blow from behind that he fell down dead. He buried him beneath the bridge, took the boar, and carried it to the king, pretending that he had killed it, whereupon he obtained the king's daughter in marriage, and when his younger brother did not come back, he said, The boar must have killed him, and everyone believed it. But as nothing remains hidden from God, so this black deed also was to come to light. Years afterwards, a shepherd was driving his herd across the bridge and saw lying in the sand beneath a snow-white little bone. He thought that it would make a good mouthpiece, so he clambered down, picked it up, and cut out of it a mouthpiece for his horn. But when he blew through it for the first time, to his great astonishment, the bone began of its own accord to sing. Ah, oh, friend, thou blowest upon my bone. Long have I laid beside the water. 
my brother slew me from the boar, and took for his wife the king's young daughter. Hmm, what a wonderful horn, said the shepherd. It sings by itself. I must take it to my lord the king. And when he came with it to the king, the horn again began to sing its little song. The king understood it all, and caused the ground below the bridge to be dug up. And then the whole skeleton of the murdered man came to light. The wicked brother could not deny the deed, and was sewn up in a sack and drowned. But the bones of the murdered man were laid to rest in a beautiful tomb in the churchyard.